for a moment, there flashed across his mind, according to Oliver Cowdery, the thought that maybe it was not an actual vision, but only a dream. In other words, his mind had concocted it rather than coming from God. So something has to prepare Joseph Smith to believe himself, and perhaps even more important, for his immediate family to believe in him too. So that instant when Joseph Smith went to Joseph Sr. and said, uh, explained that he had seen an angel visiting him in his room, um, his father's immediate reaction was, it's from God, follow the angel's advice. If Joseph Sr. had not reacted that way, uh, who knows what seeds of doubt would have been planted in Joseph's mind. Well, the money digging experience prepared him for that because of the lore of the guardians of treasure. Let us say that Joseph Sr. sees it as a guardian angel over a golden hoard and interprets it that way. Is that wrong? What I'm saying is that may have helped him to instantaneously react and say, it's good, follow it. Furthermore, what was to prepare Joseph better to look into a stone than to have looked into a stone to find lost objects and therefore prepared to look into a stone to find lost words. So, as I say, it's a speculative, speculative leap, but considering all of the conditions of Joseph Smith's life at that time, I can see uh, the money digging as possibly having played a part in preparing Joseph Smith for the, un the unique role he was to act out in, in history. Uh, I would think the problems of his self-identity were immense, figuring out what in the world am I doing having to translate when I'm totally unprepared and I don't know of anyone before me who's been asked to do such a thing. Well, the reason I, I recount all this to you is um, to indicate how problems that seemed large at one point, almost insurmountable, the treasure seeking evidence, if it is looked at and examined and thought about, can unfold in ways that we cannot foresee at the beginning and eventually come to be seen as a fairly critical part, a, con a contribution to the development of a prophet. Well, let me go on then to um, psychology, which is one of the current ways of taming Joseph Smith uh, in the 20th century and that is to label his pathologies. What psychological disease can account for his revelations? This uh, psychological analysis was not necessary in the 19th century because he was almost universally considered to be a religious fanatic. And a religious fanatic, a, a very powerful stereotype sort of almost as strong in Western thought as, as racial stereotypes, had come with it, uh, contained within itself a psychological mechanism. You didn't have to explain the psychology of a fanatic. It didn't require analysis. It was just right there in the stereotype itself. Fanatics acted like fanatics. That's what it amounted to. We, the first breakout from that view of Joseph was I. Woodbridge Riley's Yale dissertation, which was published as a book uh, in 1902, at a moment when all of American social thinking was changing from moral analysis to social or psychological analysis. The moral analysis is what is good and what is evil, and why are people good and why are people evil. 
The psychological analysis is more like sick and well. How do, you, how do people get sick and what happens to them and how do you cure them and make them well? And so modern um, social politics is really based on the, this notion of, of social pathologies that must be cured rather than social uh, evils that must be denounced and, and eradicated. And Riley was the first to uh, take this tack, which has continued down to the present, and seeing in Joseph Smith an, an epileptic, and his visions were a result of his seizures. And since then, a variety of labels have been attached to him. Von Brody thought he fit Phyllis Greenacre's imposter type with his uh, weak personality that uh, f uh, a feeble kind of um, cracked up personality that gained strength when, in, when it was in its imposter roles. Robert Anderson's narcissistic personality, William Moraine's buried trauma cl uh, complex beginning with the leg operation when Joseph is so young, devastating the young boy, uh, Moraine postulates, uh, and then being suppressed, where the memory and pain of this trauma rumbles around in his subconscious and shapes everything he does thereafter, Alvin's death adding to these traumas. And Dan Vogel's notion of a dysfunctional family with Lucy as a depressed mother, Joseph Sr. as an alcoholic, the family's in poverty, it's divided in religious, religion, and so forth. These um, psychological approaches to Joseph uh, have merits. They draw attention to parts of Joseph's experience that you might not other see, otherwise see. That's the whole point of a, an interpretation or as a theory, is to bring, turn facts into evidence. You make them work to sustain some thought, and therefore those facts leap out at you. You see things that were otherwise invisible. And um, so they, they are helpful, but I don't think that any of them succeed very well in demonstrating that Joseph Smith was a damaged pers person, that his life was twisted by his youthful experiences, and th therefore he became uh, fundamentally pathological which I think is uh, what these authors are really trying to do. And I'll tell you why I don't believe in these particular diagnoses of Joseph Smith's uh, psyche. Let me take the one which I believe has the most merit to it, or at least raises a significant issue and that is the impact of the leg operation. No matter how you cut it, it must have been a horrible experience. Uh, <laughs> just another aspect of my genius, things like that come out all the time. <laughs> it must have been a, a horrible moment for him, for his family, and then to be, in effect, a cripple, an invalid, for three years in those active years, um, hobbling around on a crutch. I kept thinking of my grandson, Max, who's in the back of the room, and how he was from ages seven to 10, and how it had been for Joseph Smith to have been uh, hobbling around all that time. And I think um, work does need to be done on estimating the impact of that experience. It's just too significant. But I don't think that Moraine's um, analysis works. After reading Moraine, I consulted with a psychiatrist at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, a man named Peter Jensen, whom I happen to home teach. That was very useful. Um, <laughs> who is the head of a children's mental health center and lectures all over the world about problems of children's mental health and asked him, could a trauma like that have so marred a personality 
that forever after it would be limping through life or take uh, many bizarre expressive form 